everyone. Um, I'm going to read to you James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl. Um, and I'm going to read it in seven parts for you. Seven parts. I'll post a video every week for you. Okay? Chapter one. Until he was four years old, James Henry Trotter had a happy life. He lived peacefully with his mother and father in a beautiful house beside the sea. There were always plenty of other children for him to play with, and there was the sandy beach for him to run about on, and the ocean to paddle in. It was the perfect life for a small boy. Then, one day, James's mother and father went to London to do some shopping, and there a terrible thing happened. Both of them suddenly got eaten up, in full daylight, mind you, and on a crowded street, by an enormous angry rhinoceros which had escaped from the London Zoo. Now this, as you can well imagine, was a rather nasty experience for two such gentle parents, but in the long run it was far nastier for James than it was for them. Their troubles were all over in a jiffy. They were dead and gone in 35 seconds flat. Poor James, on the other hand, was still very much alive and all at once he found himself alone and frightened in a vast, unfriendly world. The lovely house by the seaside had to be sold immediately and the little boy carrying nothing but a small suitcase containing a pair of pyjamas and a toothbrush was sent away to live with his two aunts. Their names were Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker and I'm sorry to say that they were both really horrible people. They were selfish and lazy and cruel and right from the beginning they started beating poor James for almost no reason at all. They never called him by his real name, but always refer referred to him as you disgusting little beast, or you filthy nuisance, or you miserable creature. And they certainly never gave him any toys to play with, or any picture books to look at. His room was as bare as a prison cell. They lived, Aunt Sponge, Aunt Spiker, and now James as well, in a queer ramshackle house on the top of a high hill in the south of England. The hill was so high that from almost anywhere in the garden James could look down and see for miles and miles across a marvellous landscape of woods and fields. And on a very clear day, if he looked in the right direction, he could see a tiny grey dot far away on the horizon, which was the house that he used to live in with his beloved mother and father. And just beyond that, he could see the ocean itself, a long thin streak of blackish blue like a line of ink beneath the rim of the sky. But James was never allowed to go down off the top of that hill. Neither Aunt Sponge nor Aunt Spiker could ever be bothered to take him out himself. Take him out herself. Not even for a small walk or a picnic. And he certainly wasn't permitted to go alone. The nasty little beast will only get into mischief if he goes out of the garden, Aunt Spiker had said. And terrible punishments were promised him, such as being locked up in the cellar with the rats for a week, if he even so much as dared to climb over the fence. The garden, which covered the whole of the top of the hill, was large and desolate, and the only tree in the entire place, apart from a clump of dirty or laurel bush bushes at the far end, was an ancient peach tree that never gave any peaches. There was no sowing, there was no sowing, there was no swing, no seesaw, no sandpit, and no other children were ever invited to come up the hill to play with poor James. There wasn't so much as a dog or a cat around to keep him company. And as time went on, he became sadder and sadder and more and more lonely. And he used to spend hours every day standing at the bottom of the garden, gazing wistfully at the lovely but forbidden world of woods and fields and ocean that were spread out below him like a magic carpet. There's the house on the top of the hill. And there's James looking wistfully down. After James Henry Trotter had been living with his aunts for three whole years, there came a morning when something rather peculiar happened to him, and this thing, which, as I say, was only rather peculiar, soon caused a second thing to happen which was very peculiar. And then the very peculiar thing, in its own turn, caused a really fantastically peculiar thing to occur. It all started on a blazing hot day in the middle of summer. Aunt Sponger, Aunt Spiker and James were all out in the garden. James had been put to work as usual. This time he was chopping wood for the kitchen stove. Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were sitting comfortably in deck chairs nearby, sipping tall glasses of fizzy lemonade and watching him to see that he didn't stop work for one moment. 
Aunt Sponge was enormously fat and very short. She had small piggy eyes, a sunken mouth, and one of those white flabby faces that looked exactly as though it had been boiled. She was like a great white soggy overboiled cabbage. Aunt Spiker, on the other hand, was lean and tall and bony, and she wore steel-rimmed spectacles that fixed onto the end of her nose with a clip. She had a screeching voice and long, wet, narrow lips, and whenever she got angry or excited, little flecks of spit would come shooting out of her mouth as she talked. And there they sat, these two ghastly hags, sipping their drinks, and every now and again screaming at James to chop faster and faster. They also talked about themselves, each one saying how beautiful she thought she was. Aunt Sponge had a long-handled mirror on her lap and she kept picking it up and gazing at her own hideous face. I look and smell, Aunt Sponge declared, as lovely as a rose. Just feast your eyes upon my face, observe my shapely nose. Behold my heavenly silky locks, locks and if I take off both my socks you'll see my dainty toes. But don't forget, Aunt Spike cried, how much your tummy shows. Aunt Sponge went red. Aunt Spiker said, my sweet, she cannot win. Behold my gorgeous curvy shape, my teeth, my charming grin. Oh, beauteous me, how I adore my radiant looks. And please ignore the pimple on my chin. My dear old trout, Aunt Sponge cried out, your only bones and skin. Such loveliness as I possess. Oh, it can only truly shine in Hollywood, Aunt Sponge declared. Oh, wouldn't that be fine? I'd capture all the nation's hearts, they'd give me all the leading parts, the stars would all resign. I think you'd make, Aunt Spiker said, a lovely Frankenstein. Poor James was still slaving away at the chopping block. The heat was terrible. He was sweating all over, his arm was aching. The chopper was a large blunt thing, far too heavy for a small boy to use. And as he worked, James began thinking about all the other children in the world and what they might be doing at that moment. Some will be riding tricycles in their gardens. Some will be walking in cool woods and picking bunches of wildflowers. And all the little friends whom he used to know will be down by the seaside playing in the wet sand and splashing around in the water. Great tears began oozing out of James's eyes and rolling down his cheeks. He stopped working and leaned against the chopping block, overwhelmed by his own unhappiness. What's the matter with you? Aunt Spiker screeched, glaring at him over the top of her steel spectacles. James began to cry. Stop that immediately and get on with your work, you nasty little beast, Aunt Sponge ordered. Oh, Auntie Sponge, James cried out, and Auntie Spiker, couldn't we all, please, just for once, go down to the seaside on the bus? It isn't very far and I feel so hot and awful and lonely. Why, you lazy good-for-nothing brute, Aunt Spiker shouted. Beat him, cried Aunt Sponge. I certainly will, Aunt Spiker snapped. She glared at James, and James looked back at her with large, frightened eyes. I shall beat you later, on in the day, when I don't feel so hot, she said. And now get out of, out of my sight, you disgusting little worm, and give me some peace. James turned and ran. He ran off as fast as he could to the far end of the garden and hid himself behind that clump of dirty old laurel bushes that we mentioned earlier on. Then he covered his face with his hands and began to cry and cry. It was at this point that the first thing of all, the rather peculiar thing that led to so many other much more peculiar things happened to him. For suddenly, just behind him, James heard a rustling of leaves, and he turned round and saw an old man in a funny dark green suit emerging from the bushes. He was a very small old man, but he had a huge bald head and a face that was covered all over with bristly black whiskers. He stopped where he was about three yards away, and he stood there leaning on his stick and staring hard at James. When he spoke, his voice was very slow and creaky. Come closer to me, little boy, he said, beckoning to James with his finger. Come right up close to me and I will show you something wonderful. James was too frightened to move. The old man hobbled a step or two nearer and then he put a hand into the pocket of his jacket and took out a small white paper bag. You see this, he whispered, waving the bag gently to and fro in front of James's face. You know what this is, my dear. You know what's inside this little bag. Then he came nearer, still leaning forward and pushing his face so close to James that James could feel breath blowing on his cheeks. 
The breath smell musty and stale and slightly mildewed like air in an old cellar. Take a look, my dear, he said, opening the bag and tilting it towards James. Inside it, James could see a mass of tiny green things that looked like little stones or crystals, each one about the size of a grain of rice. They were extraordinarily beautiful and there was a strange brightness about them, a sort of luminous quality that made them glow and sparkle in the most wonderful way. Listen to them, the old man whispered. Listen to them move. James stared into the bag and sure enough there was a faint rustling sound coming up from inside it and then he noticed that all thousands of little green things were slowly, very slowly, stirring around and moving each other as though they were alive. There's more power and magic in those things, in there and in all the rest of the world put together, the old man said softly. But, but what are they? James murmured, finding his voice at last. Where do they come from? Aha, the old man whispered, you'd never guess that. He was crouching a little now and pushing his face still closer and closer to James until the tip of his long nose was actually touching the skin on James's forehead. Then suddenly he jumped back and began waving his stick madly in the air. Crocodile tongues, he cried. One thousand long slimy crocodile tongues boiled up in the night, in the skull of a dead witch for twenty days and nights with the eyeballs of a lizard. Add the fingers of a young monkey, the gizzard of a pig and the beak of a green parrot, the juice of a porcupine and three spoonfuls of sugar. Stew for, an, stew for another week and then let the moon do the rest. All at once he pushed the white paper bag into James's hands and said, Here, you take it. It's yours. James Henry Trotter stood there clutching the bag and staring at the old man. And now, the old man said, all you've got to do is this. Take a large jug of water and pour all the little green things into it. Then very slowly, one by one, add ten hairs from your own head. That sets them off, it gets them going. In a couple of minutes, the water will begin to froth and bubble furiously. And as soon as that happens, you must quickly drink it all down, the whole jug full in one gulp. And then, my dear, you will feel it churning and boiling in your stomach and steam will start coming out of your mouth. And immediately after that, marvellous things will start happening to you. Fabulous, unbelievable things. And you will never be miserable again in your life. Because you are miserable, aren't you? You needn't tell me, I know all about it. Now off you go and do it exactly as I say. And don't whisper a word of this to those two horrible aunts of yours. Not a word. And don't let those green things in there get away from you either. Because if they do escape, then they will be working their magic upon somebody else instead of upon you. And that isn't what you want at all, is it, my dear? Whoever they meet first, be it bug, insect, animal or tree, that will be the one who gets the full power of their magic. So, hold the bag tight. Don't tear the paper. Off you go. Hurry up. Don't wait. Now's the time. Hurry. With that, the old man turned away and disappeared into the bushes. The next moment, James was running back towards the house as fast as he could go. He would do it all in the kitchen, he told, it, told himself. If only he could get in there without Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker seeing him. He was terribly excited. He flew through the long grass and the stinging nettles, not caring whether he got stung or not on his bare knees. And in the distance, he could see Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker sitting in their chairs with their back towards him. He swerved away from them so as to go around the other side of the house. But then suddenly, just as he was passing underneath the old peach tree that stood in the middle of the garden, his foot slipped and he fell flat on his face in the grass. The paper bag burst open as it hit the ground and the thousands of tiny green things were scattered in all directions. James immediately picked himself up to, onto his hands and knees and started searching around for his precious treasures. But what was this? They were all sinking into the soil. He could actually see them wriggling and twisting as they burrowed their way downward into the hard earth. And at once he reached out to pick some of them up before it was too late, but they disappeared right under his fingers. He went after some others and the same thing happened. He began scrabbling around frantically in an effort to catch hold of those that were left, but they were too quick for him. Each time the tips of his fingers were just about to touch them, they vanished into the earth and soon, in the space of only a few seconds, every single one of them had gone. 
James felt like crying. He would never get them back now. They were lost, lost, lost forever. But where have they gone to? And why in the world had they been so eager to push down into the earth like that? What were they after? There was nothing down there, nothing except the roots of the old peach tree and a whole lot of earthworms and centipedes and insects living in the soil. But what was it the old man had said? Whoever they meet first, be it bug, insect, animal or tree, that will be the one who gets the full power of their magic. Good heavens, thought James. What is going to happen in that case if they do meet an earthworm or a centipede or a spider? And what if they do get, get go into the roots of the peach tree? Get up at once, you lazy little beast! A voice was suddenly shouting in James's ear. James glanced up and saw Aunt Spiker standing over him, grim and tall and bony, glaring at him through her steel room spectacles. Get back over there immediately and finish chopping up those logs, she ordered. Aunt Sponge, fat and pulpy as a jellyfish, came waddling up beside, behind her sister to see what was going on. Why don't we just lower the boy down the well in a bucket and leave him there for the night, she suggested. That ought to teach him not to laze around like this the whole day long. That's a very good wheeze, my dear sponge. But let's make him finish chopping up the wood first. Be off with you at once, you hideous brat, and do some work. Slowly, sadly, poor James got up off the ground and went back to the wood pile. Oh, if only he hadn't slipped and fallen and dropped that precious bag. All hope of a happier life had gone completely now. Today and tomorrow and the next day and all the other days as well would be nothing but punishment and pain, unhappiness and despair. He picked up the chopper and was just about to start chopping away again when he heard a shout behind him that made him stop and turn. That was part one and I will post a video part two next week for you. Bye!